the game two, you can see the Pigot Van up on the screen. And it's going to be Nidalee banned away off the get go here. And rise I think, to follow. I think it's important to also put the previous result into context. You know, it did end up being a very one sided win for SK Telecom. Remember, that was with a draft where they were able to ban Tarek on the red side, despite the fact that usually you have to ban the overpowered champions, and 6.10 Tarek doesn't really have the same impact that the, the release rework Tarek did. But more importantly, they blind picked both their soul lanes. And okay, their power picks, but they gave KT free information, and KT ended up squandering it in a couple of different ways. So yep. it says a lot that a team can reach for these picks, accept any counter picks, and just bulldoze the opponent. Well, you mentioned that Tarek is going to be banned away, as is Echo here to finish off the bans from SK Telecom. And Kindred, the final one from the KT Rolster. So don't want Blank to get his hands on that. They know that he's uh, quite adept with that champion. So they take it away from him, but Elise still on the board. And Azir makes it through, and Baker's just going to play it again. All right, you get a do-over, Fly. Well, forget about the first game. If you can dismantle the Faker Azir this time, I don't think he's going to be able to do it. Neither do I. Maybe he'll play Zed. That would actually be interesting. Watch he just locks the Alien Soul again. <laughs> you could try Twisted Fate, which is a fly champion, and try and play around the laning phase to make some plays around the map, but there really is an auto-win lane champions against Azir, and that's one of the reasons why he's a sort of champion you can pretty freely pick in early rotation mid. I mean, how we saw Faker playing all over the map with Azir, so... It'd be hard to match him even with something like a Twisted Fate KT though. Taking their time on this first round. We saw Long hover over the Caitlyn, so definitely playing around with the idea of that pickup. Well, you know what SKT are gonna pick. Why not? Why would they not just pick basically the same champions they did in game one? And these draft, these picks won't necessarily change the draft. Obviously you can swap Elise for Rek'Sai. They're light for like when it comes to powerful early game control junglers. SKT. Faker flash the Aurelian Soul okay. for a bit of manners and they lock in the Swain. It's going to be another top lane Swain. The one mid lane Swain we saw actually put out a lot of work earlier this week, but the top lane Swains have struggled to have quite the same impact. Yeah, especially Smeps. But Smep uh, and Someday both had their struggles. Yeah. Pick is still very powerful. Swain is definitely overtuned on patch 6.10. That's another way to say he's OP. But yeah, it, well, those nerfs are coming in pretty soon, so then we'll just be a couple weeks out from these guys getting onto that patch. What do you try if you fly against the Azir? Aurelian Soul is the one that, again, uh, is supposed to be able to just baby his own way through laning phase because he can be so much more creative with his shopping times and get through the lane, but he certainly wasn't able to do that in game one. So will he pivot or will they just go for Aurelian Soul again? Well, they're running down the clock on this one. Keep cutting back over to the oh, Skasua. Oh, is Someday oh, going to do it? Oh, my God. All right, Someday. Make us a believer of Yasuo top against Swain. Swain was always famously strong against melee champions, and this is very much a melee matchup. Someday loves his carry Yasuo. Remember, he used to pick this into Nar at every opportunity, and although you can block a lot of Nara's abilities. I really don't know about the Swain matchup because his sustain should be able to get through even the biggest of all ends from Yasuo. I, I mean, uh, you're sorry, worried. I'm, I'm picking up my jaw. I'm picking my jaw up off the floor right now. I just the last thing, you know. I woke up this morning and I was like, all right, gonna go to work in the Castle League of Legends. You know, maybe we'll see something new like a Vladimir in Korea. This is not. I did new. not anticipate. This is new for this season. This is new for you, but this, this is, is not new for Someday. This Someday is new for this loves season, top though. lane Yasuo. Sure. And he's going to make it work, but... But when's the last time that he played that? Uh, last season. Like and spring split or season it, I believe maybe at the start of spring split, but definitely a lot in summer last year. So you're okay. right. But it's still very much going to be a similar uh. build. And we probably won't see this moving forward because Trinity Force changes make it actually difficult for Yasuo That's very true. No on 6.11. So maybe it's a love letter to 6.10 Trinity Force Yasuo as well. Quite possibly. So this is just not how I expected my day to be going so far, but I am not disappointed, so let me stress that. But of course the Ezreal going to be going over to Bang, as well as the Karma for Wolf, and now Hachani playing around with its last pick support. Keeps flashing that Blitzcrank. We saw Snowflower play it. 
didn't go so well. Now the issue he has is that Bard for team comp would actually be really important. The ability to Bard ult the Azir to stop some of the setup is actually great. But if they don't take Braum, they have no knock-up synergy whatsoever for the Yasuo. So they're kind of pigeonholed into taking Braum, who will struggle greatly hey in man, these team fights. Blitzcrank's got a knock-up too. They're not going to pick Blitzcrank. Now, Alistar's available. Okay, so Alistar's going to make it in. So this is, uh, you know, a pick that we've seen the priority really fall off hard on uh, in Korea so far. Saw so earlier today in the NALCS, they still kind of like it. But this, the early power of this Alistar you know, going for turret dives early on, it's just not really there anymore with that 50% reduction. It's just it takes so much more damage. So the turrets were buffed and his turret damage reduction or his damage reduction in general was nerfed. So I understand that part of it. The big thing for the Alistar specifically is also in this particular game, he's going to take more damage and he's going to have to get a melee range of all the incidental yeah. AoE damage from both Azir and the Swain and just perish. So he's going to be there for the ult, but you can't bait anymore. That's what was taken away from Alistar. We saw Gorilla so often fall to 200 HP, pop the ult and be fine. Now you have to proactively ult a, a lot more at higher health values to get anywhere near the same survivability in a team fight. Well, this is going to be... One hell of an interesting game across the board. The Jin coming back out here for Arrow. Probably going to be using that same build path that we saw starting off with the Yoko's Ghost Blade. You can see the crowd here in the OGN East Stadium in Sangam. Full house tonight, just about. To be clear, KT will struggle heavily if they try to team fight with this comp. They have a squishy backline of Vagar and Jin, and no frontline because they now have the Yasuo top. Alistar situational, but been nerfed. At least as a solo tank isn't going to work out, and the sustained damage from SKT is crazy. So split push Yasuo. That's the dream for KT Rolster. Uh, we'll see if somebody can pull it off, but I'm more interested in this mid lane, actually. The Vagar coming back in here for Fly, going up against Faker on this Azir yet again. Let's see if he can solo carry or if he has to be dependent on his teammates this time around. We're going to find out as we get into game two. All right, well, what a way to kick things off. Another Infernal Drake. Fire burns forever between SK Telecom and KT Roaster. It was before League of Legends. It will also last longer than League of Legends, you'd have to imagine. Whatever eSport is around in Korea, we will see KT and SKT butting heads. And it's always a treat to watch. Yep. The Telecom War rages on for Time Eternal. So Vagar, you were, you were talking about the mid lane matchup. Yes. Obviously, he is going to have heavy problems with the sustained trades in lane when it comes to harass. With the mage rework changes, he gets a lot more ability power than he used to because he's able to just get in and any sort of damage trade that he does actually gives him ability power as well. So those ability power numbers should be through the roof. The way this comp will function, I mentioned the split push element. The other thing that KT have is a pick comp because if they ever get vision control, pink wards come down, anything along those ilk, Alistair, Elise, and the Vagar can get a pick, and then if they can explode someone, then they can look to fight 5v4. But if we see even 5v5 fights, if we see SKT control the map like they were able to in game one, that's where the comp falls apart for KT, because Jin is only as strong as his frontline, and with specifically the Alistair nerfs till very late in the game, it's going to be a struggle for KT. Yep. Another interesting thing, thing to note, though, Arrow using the the Thunderlords as his Keystone Mastery, not going for the Death Fire Touch, something that we do or have seen a lot of from Jins in the past, you know, uh, kind of akin to Jace, where you're hitting from so far back, you want that Death Fire Touch on. Uh, so going for that, that triple hit for the damage. Speaking of damage, though, Arrow already taking a plethora of it as Bang and Wolf just push them up and back to the tower. And so, returning to that point, the... Thunderlords actually loses out in terms of damage to the death by a touch outside of one scenario. You take Thunderlords for laning phases. Why right? Marta was taking Thunderlords on Alistair because yeah. it gives you the early damage. The base value is so much higher. The death by a touch is so strong onto Jin just because each ult, uh, ult uh, bullet procs the death by a touch and does surprising amounts. And because it scales with AD on a champion that has multiple percentage AD scalings in his kit, it is very powerful. But this is just 
the laning phase has been a struggle. Let's go for laning power as early as possible. Yeah. You can see plenty of fans out there holding up their signs today. You can only expect it to get uh, you know, fuller and fuller as the day goes on. Still early yet here in Korea. 2 p.m. start today, so. See how many people can make it out. We still have another set of games after this one as well, but you can see in this bottom side, Duke moving oh, far Duke. forward. He's gonna throw out the W because somebody going really low. He dashes back in, flash away from Duke. Can he land it? It's not oh. gonna happen. He jukes it out and they will uh, just go their separate ways, but that's gonna be a flash down here for the Swain. And someday almost pulled off the solo kill. You'll notice that he was really on point of his flow meter. Knowing that he'd have the shield up, it looked like he would die to just a couple of auto attacks. But because the flow came up at the right time, he was just connecting with a Q away from getting the solo kill on Duke. Yeah, really close. And now Blank finding score in the jungle here at the Raptors. And Baker's just going to go a little bit aggressive here on a fly. Who will have to keep track of with that AP. You, ma you mentioned the changes and how it can grow to a, a massive number of AP very quickly. I remember seeing a, a solo queue game of Skara where he had about 1,000 AP in 19 minutes. Well, that's ludicrous. And that level of scaling probably won't happen in competitive play, but a man can dream, as you mentioned. Someday is a super, super good Yasuo player. This is very much one of his solo queue picks to get him off tilt, to really enjoy himself. And he makes it work. The Na matchup had a great degree of sense. And in general, against ranged matchups, if you have purely ranged abilities that can be blocked by Windwall, it's oh. up. Yeah, that's going to be the headbutt straight. Oh, the alley oop. Wonderful CC chaining right there by the side of KT. And they're going to find first blood. Very well executed by Hachani. Nice and clean, the sort of plays that SKT were able to make in game one now. Deftly pulled off by KT Rolster. You can almost say it was simple and clean, Papa. And now, just the trading goes back and forth here in the mid. And so, the question this game is, can Fly hold his own? That's all he needs to do. You know, the, the previous game, once again, we return, was all about Fly being so far behind that he was a detriment rather than being able to just split CS or, you know, lose out to 20 CS. And the nope. trades continue in bot. This is someday. He's going to keep going in. Before the ultimate, he should handily win trades because he will have minions to jump out and be able to block abilities with the win wars. Just what do these fights look like with ult, specifically level 2 ult? When you get that flat scaling on the amount of heal, you worry for someday just not having the burst to finish off and then the sustain from Swain winning the extended trade. Yep. See, though, Duke just having a hard time landing those never moves because someday's just continually. Oh, if there's a minion wave, them. you're not hitting any never moves. He keeps trying for it. <laughs> so, really, at that point, all he's doing is wasting mana. Score, though. Looking for a gank in the mid side. Wolf is here to back up, but Hachani waiting on the other side. The cocoon's not going to land, and Baker just dashes right out of that event horizon. So, Fly will not be able to get the catch. But here comes Hachani. Gets the headbutt pulverized. But uh, again, all the CC has been expended from the side of KT. So, it's going to be a little bit of harass. Worth noting that if the event horizon was half a second early, you can't dash straight through it. But because it hadn't yeah, registered, right. you're able to just QE your way through if you are the Azir. Lightning phase. You know, it couldn't go much worse than it went in game one. But is a lot more competitive this game, which is yeah. good for KT. They are winning this early into the game in gold, and of course, with that first blood. Yeah, we can see that's already the Dirk for Arrow, as he's just going to continue towards that Yomu's Ghost Blade, much like we saw in the last game. I mean, Yomu's versus Tier is just about the, the best item build you can do. It's immediate power it's versus literally no combat stats, and it's whether this is the staple build for Jin going forward or whether it's a build that makes sense specifically into Ezreal, that's a question I don't have to answer. Draven, for example, for long, a Bloodthirst AD carry has been going Yomu's first irrespective of matchup. But we've seen mostly Essence Reaver from the Jins, but I love it in this case. Well, here we go straight on to Wolf. Wolf. The, the chains come through yet again. Headbutt pulverize into the W from the Jin into the Cocoon. There's just nothing you can do when Wolf goes down yet again, so KT really executing well together so far. Worth knowing that both kills have unfortunately gone over to score, and yeah. whether he will be able to find itemization. Now, if he can build a Snowball Aegis, that would actually be really big. Remember, he's against double AP and the magic damage from Ezreal yeah. on the side of SKT. So Banner of Command, actually, which is a very staple Elise item, that comes quick. Then maybe that justifies the kill gold not going over to the Jin. Can't always be 
picky in those scenarios, but both bot laners sniped away by nice pathing, specifically from score. Yeah, and this is just a much better start here for KT compared to that first game where they were really struggling. You can see, in addition to that first blood gold, they now have a dragon and about a 700 gold lead on the board. So things looking uh, pretty good for these guys. Duke now, of course, level seven, gonna have that sustained from the ultimate. Someday though, not fearing this so much. You can see he's still trading back a bit. Duke gonna go back into that ultimate form and regen as much as he can. Someday still playing forward. Gets a knock up, goes straight in for the last breath. But a Johnny now arriving. It's gonna be Duke back. Vegas off. roaming up yep. as well. You see the roam coming up, but they will they be need to spotted get out of by here. a ward. They're gonna go in, Finger goes in deep, but he gets hit by pulverized immediately. The never move still not gonna connect, and Duke has to flash away. Someday will still fall, however, nicely played there by Duke to get out from underneath of that tower. Faker was a little bit worried there when that headbutt pulverize came out, but he still gets the kill. So Hachani, because he walked directly in lane, couldn't set up much defensive vision, so they ended up being basically surprised by the Azir run. There was some really oh, nice mechanics. Faker's gonna go back in, gets the Emperor's Divide. It's gonna be the flash away there from Hachani, but he's not level six. Faker throws do it. out the soldiers, there it is, takes him down. That's also gonna draw out the TP here from someday. Nicely played, Faker putting two on the board. Um, that was greedy from Achani, was level five, not quite level six. Even though he had flash up, he tried to buffer the headbutt flash away. It wasn't enough. And now, you know, we talked about two early kills and the kill distribution, both kills on Faker. So even though the lane hasn't been quite the same playground for Faker this time out, he finds his kills anyway. Yep. And uh, despite the roam, he's not falling behind in CS really at all. It's just five separating him and Fly at the moment. And that's the reality of Vega. Vega doesn't apply lane pressure until he has enough AP to one-shot the backline with yeah. the Dark Matter. So for now, and in general, given how the laning phase is gone, you heavily expect Vega to be on the back foot, just chilling oh. and clearing waves. Uh oh, well, look at this. Waiting in the brush for Blank and Faker to come around and looking for They're not for that moving, blue. so that means the Tremor Sense hasn't spotted them out yet. Yep, and it looks like they might be able to find Blank. Actually, he's going into the enemy jungle looking for the Raptors. Won't find them. So he's going to go in deep, and this is actually just going to be score and fly, sitting in a brush for God knows how long. There's just no upside for SKT to go to that area. It's one of the few places they can be picked. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Here we Faker go. Faker doesn't know, though. Yeah, Faker does not know. That's the event horizon coming down. Has to blow the flash uh -oh. if he wants to get out. He's waiting for it. Can't shift over. And someday with the roam down, we'll finish off for the kill. And while it'll be cathartic to finally kill him, it took three members. They missed multiple skill shots. There was some inevitability about them picking up the kill, but everything else didn't really go to script for KT. Yeah, but well now this is going to lead to a blue buff take here by score. They spot him by the, with the wolf spirit, but they're not going to be able to go in and try to contest this one. So blue buff does get taken as well as Faker's life. It's fun tracking how the wind wall interacts with some of Swain's abilities. It's just not a matchup that we have any data points on. Yeah. You don't see Swain in solo queue until again, very much the recent patches in top lane. Yasuo yeah, felt like a pick oh of the past. Boy, here we go. Opening Wolf. up on Wolf. Yeah, getting locked down, trying to juke out these That's bullets. flash up, though. He's missed all of them so far. Last one waiting. Arrow throws it. It's not going to connect a single shot. And Wolf will miraculously live in that 1v2 scenario, despite all of the CC coming through. Worth knowing that even though this should be a tough matchup, Someday is ahead in CS by about 15, so... Top lane Yasuo finding a farm advantage is a win in itself. I mean, that early pressure that he got from the get-go was uh, pretty much key for him getting ahead in that lane. And he's Speaking been rolling with it the whole time, and he's actually going to pick up a Phantom Dancer first here. And that makes sense when it comes to, you know, obviously the crit strike and attack speed doesn't need to be spoken about, but the passive, the fact that he's taking 12% less damage from the continuous sustained damage from the Swain makes the most sense of the zeal purchase options that he had in top lane, so I do like the Phantom Dancer. Yomu's Ghost Blade also complete, so KT have an item advantage in terms of power spikes in multiple lanes. Yeah. So let's see if they can grow a CS advantage or rotate score around because he's the one again who's been the big winner in the early game for KT. Well, as you can see right there, it's about 140 AP so far for Fly on the Vega. The way you want to play this KT is that you know, the moment you enter lane and the enemy sees you have a Yomu's Ghost Blade, they're going to have to hold back. They're going to have to be passive. So objectives, Dragon, and now you can see the Rift Herald being started should be a given. And the way you get and, and the way you play from there is get those pink wards down, have them stick, and force the picks. We said it before, Elise, Alistair, Vega, all have pick potential. 
and the picks are where KT can win this game. Well, as KT is looking for a pick potentially of their own as they start crashing that wave into the tower. See, though, the ward in that tri brush going to spot them out so they won't be able to go for it. Dragon now spawning in about 40 seconds. As KT have to rotate first because they don't have teleport on their mid lane, and KT can fall, be able to choose their options a bit oh, wow. Like going in really aggressively in the jungle, gets into the tunnel in time, so he's not going to get caught up by that W. But he's also not going to be able to steal away this blue buff. They're delaying the mid lane a lot. Faker now has his way with the mini wave, can just get more turret shots in. Uh, the mini wave doesn't quite cooperate, so yeah. he won't actually get turret damage, but he might be able to get 25% of the turret's hit points down as a cost for Vega picking up the blue. Oh. Shots coming out, looks like Vang caught a couple of them, but not gonna be enough to take him down, so still gonna be safe here on this Ezreal and the bot. Just has that Manamuda completed, still working his way towards the Sheen, so maybe a little bit more time before he can effectively trade with Arrow, who has a Young Boost Ghost Blade completed already. Again, we see Score returning to bot to pass. There's a pink ward in the brush that they need to clear. Oh, they're gonna use a regular ward as well, so he can't walk forward. With that, he's gonna go ahead and exit the lane. Flank. Not going to be able to find an entry for this gank in mid. Fly is still going to remain pretty safe for the most part. Oh, flash away by Wolf there. So while Fly has got a lot of CS, and you think, okay, he's doing well, he's building his items, his items still have a pretty big degree of emergenciness about them. They are very much laning items. He has a Negatron cloak and boots of swiftness just to get away from ganks, just to kite out of yep. sand soldiers and potentially the wreck site on Burrow coming through. So he's not building selfishly for ability battle. It's not a Merlinomicon into Death Cat build brewing just yet. He has been forced to use some of the gold that he's earned to basically get through lane. Yeah, we can see someday he's been stretching the CS lead a little bit here up, up, up top now. 32 to 109. Duke's just not been. Uh Having very much fun up here with this Swain. So there's two schools of thought when you're dealing with tricky lanes. There's Fly, who's going for laning items. That's bot lane. Oh, yeah, Bang gonna get locked up by that W. Hachani hot on his heels, but the Arcane Shift will take Bang out to safety, so he's gonna be able to stick around. But again, KT just showing that they're completely on point with chaining these CC together. Just to complete the thought, there's two mindsets when you're in a tricky lane. There's I'm gonna build for lane, which is what Negatron Cloak Swiftness Boots was. And there's what Duke's doing, which is I'm gonna play defensively, hold back, build my core items anyway, not build for lane in the slightest, and just deal with a bit of CS hole. And it's very much a mindset thing, a defensive-minded player like Fly is more likely to just build laning stats for, well, I got ganked a lot last game. If I get ganked and build for lane, then I might get through those ganks. Whereas Duke is just like, I'm gonna deal with this annoying physical damage dealer, but still hit my Rod of Ages time, timing. And if I'm not ganked, I'll come out and profit. So Duke will profit from this decision. And although Abyssal Scepter is fine on Vega, the cooldown reduction and the itemization actually helps out Vega in some ways, it's still not ideal for the tiny major people. Yep. So the, the, the uh, Ninja Tabby does come in for Duke, so he is starting to optimize for that matchup against someday. Well, Zonius is him. the most obvious next item for yeah. him as well, right? So. Yeah. Which will also help him uh, immensely against Arrow, who is still at 0-0-2 Jin at the moment. We can see another Dirk in the inventory on top of the Yomu, so looking pretty good. Blank going to be looking for this red steel. Oh, the Empress of Vine. Characteristic miss there by Baker. Smite comes out Thunder's here as the goes pinch. over. Score going to get popped up. Going to get locked up by the Never Move. That's going to be a kill going over to the Duke. And now someday, fighting off more than he can chew. Dashes over the wall towards the Krugs. Baker going to go in. Does not get hit by the Event Horizon. He's going to find the kill, but he's caught between the two turrets. Can he make it out? Yes, he can. But here comes Hachani. The Headbutt Pulverize with the Ignite to try to finish him off. And Hachani's going to get the kill. Tippy in for someday. Says, hey, man, I wanted that. He doesn't get a piece. But how does SKT pull off a full court press like they were able to? Duke responded to the enemy red buff before someday could. In the mid lane, Faker was effectively turret diving the Vega and in bot, Ezreal had somehow pushed up the Jin. So that's the question is, given the early power spice, given the tenure of the game, I don't understand how SKT on command can control waves as well as they pulled up here. And I think it's more about KT not understanding their power spikes and not really being as competitive on the map as they should have been able to. Yep. See, Blank is looking to keep up that competition as he goes over to this Drake. We'll take it down. This will be the second of the game first for SKT. 
Unfortunately for them, it's just a cloud break, so more mo more mobility, not going to be uh, a bad stat by any means, but definitely not going to be as powerful as getting that mountain or another infernal. Yeah, it's more about the stacking it provides towards the buff that comes from the Elder Drake rather than necessarily the 15 move speed out of combat. Yeah, didn't get to take a peek at what's coming up next. So once we hover around that Dragon Pit again, we'll get a spot out on it and see what they have. Fly and Faker continue their tussle in the mid lane. Once again, Vagar doing just fine in this lane. So pass marks to fly at least for game two. Laning face has gone immeasurably better than game one. Yeah, he hasn't died a million times. Yep. Just for once. Someday, forced to go into Spectre's Cal. Obviously, Hex Drinker jumps off the page as yeah. an item against Swain. But because it's not burst magic damage, you actually get very little value out of the Hex Drinker shield against Swain because he just keeps pushing out damage. It's not bursts like, for example, Akartha's ult, the Hex Drink has always been famously good against. So Spectre's Cow just provides so much more value. And now he's continuing with the uh, items to deal with the Swain in picking up the Executioner's Calling to inflict those Grievous Wounds. Well, right now, SKT taking their time, slowing things down and just trying to find Pick. We can see Blank finding someday in the jungle, but score down on this bottom side, so unable to collapse and try to get a kill onto the wreck side. A lot of attention being paid to this bottom side. The Elise coming in from behind, as is Hachani. Looks like Wolf and Bang gonna have to exit, but they can't make up their minds if they're gonna stick around. Looks like they might risk it. Wave's not there, and now Blank getting found. We'll be able to tunnel out, and it's gonna be another Cloud Drake coming up, so hooray, we get to start stacking those. Not quite the game one triple, triple infernal. infernal into a into mountain. A yep. How unfortunate. Uh, at least game two is looking a lot more competitive. Game one was not necessarily in the books at 20 minutes, but it yeah. very much felt like it was a crawl towards an inevitable SKT victory. It was significantly more one-sided, I'd say that. But rotation from SKT, Rek'Sai parts aggressively. They knew that Alistair had just gone to shop, so they will take the turret under the nose. Oh, wow. Lots of damage coming out, but the tunnel will take him just outside of that uh, curtain call right there. So Arrow unable to find the kill, but there was a big crit coming out. 536 damage already from the one and a half item Jin. CS advantage in top has grown to about 27, so close to 30 CS advantage there. Faker's gotten a bit of a lead in mid, but... Again, only about just the 10, and feels like once again, some days the one with the winning lane, and the other lanes even or slightly behind for KT. That's very normal. We say winning lanes going uh, a bit in his favor, as we can see right here, but Duke looking to turn uh -oh. his back around, and some days completely uh -oh. out of everything that he can use. Flash not going to be met by Duke, but forcing that out on some day, and you can see he starts winning those trades early, but as soon as he uses the last breath, he's got nothing more. Rod of Ages becoming such a more battle item actually helps Swain a lot of ways. So it's lost, you know, the passive. Whoop, but mid lane, the all in doesn't happen that time. But it's lost the passive regeneration. Now it's more about health turning into mana and trades in general. Yeah. Being aggressive with that item. And given that Swain, you know, wades in and is in extended trades, it should be getting a lot of value out of the catalyst changes. What is it now? The catalyst is not of the protector, it's uh Catalyst of the something. I, I can't remember exactly what it is, though. Well, it doesn't protect. It ba it's a battle item now, so that's what Riot's done. They've got Elder Drakes you have to fight for. They've got passive regeneration swapped for active sustain, so making the game more fighting oriented, and that means the games in general have been easier on the eye. Yeah, and I mean, they've also, at least for us here, have been quite short lately. Where before we were used to very long games. I mean, Jin Air is still delivering some long ones, but their final game that we saw in their first set was sub-35 minutes, I believe. So even them are picking up the pace. Average game time will definitely go down, at least if things continue. Bang was stunned up by both CCs. You see the curtain call opening again. Yep. Oh, on to Karma. Yeah, get some good damage in, so it's going to push them back a bit. I like how Blank avoided all the shots. He was like, I'm fine, guys. He was just cruising on through. Gold lead, definitely just a couple of thousand. 
No panic stations established just yet. I'm excited to see where the build goes from someday. He's gone back and bought Merc Treads. Ah, it's Catalyst of Aeons. Okay. That's what it is. It's no longer of the project Protector, so no. just changing things up. I don't mind the change, you know, obviously the name is kind of whatever, but it's just a symbol, you know, the name has changed because the identity of the item has changed. Yeah, exactly. From passive to much more active. It makes sense. It's just one of those items that's been around for a while, and it's like, man, it's no longer the same. A lot of pressure coming. This would be the third outer turret if SKT were to pick it up, and it's obviously only about 20% health right now. They should add a new, like, tank item. Call it the Golden Heart to harken back to Heart of Gold. It goes along with Frozen Heart, so it's. You'd be like, nah, hey, nah, look, it's all yeah. I'm saying is old items can come back. We've got Blood Razor back in the game, so why can't we feel good about Heart of Gold we one day? We sort of have Blood Razor. No, we back. have an item called Blood Razor in the game. I know. And it's, it's not, you know. It's not the Madrid's Blood Razor, though. Yeah, but Madrid's Blood Razor was a, a bad item. It was great if you were caught. <laughs> it was a bad item conceptually. It was like. It was a bit of a noob trap, so the new Blood Razor, I think, has more validity to it. Sorry to all the fans that really enjoyed building Blood Razor on Warwick and uh, Cogmore once upon a time. Yep, those were the days. And then you built better items on this champion. Uh, I just missed my Heart of Gold Malphite top in the Force of Nature if they had AP. And then you just stacked armor for days and you crushed everybody. Jungle Ramus, double Heart of Gold. So triple Heart of yeah. Gold, double Philosopher's Stone. Heart of Gold was like the best item I, like, just cost for stats the best item that has probably ever been in the game. Uh, it was also a product of a time and place. I think in the previous season, if we had Gold for 10, given how long the games were, it would have once again been a Gold for 10 meta. But as the games get shorter, like this game, the attraction of passive gold generation kind of goes down. It feels like Sightstone in a lot of ways was the new GP10, just also allowed League to evolve into the vision battles that soon ensued after Sightstone was released. Yeah. Not that there wasn't vision before, but everything changed a lot around that time. Uh, just thinking about those good old days, there's a lot of hidden features back then as well that were Pretty fun to uh, play around with. Well, no they've... more defensive itemization for some day. Infinity Edge coming next. Oh, wow. a lot of damage. Yeah, gonna go ahead and pop that Zonia's, but the bullets are waiting for him. Mistimes the first one there from Arrow, and he's just gonna go ahead and cancel the curtain calls, so and he will get that refund in. But uh, pretty close catch there on Duke. Gonna have to be a bit more cautious, especially with that Zonia's now on cooldown. KT, going to have to come over and check for this Baron. Really nice. Use of the Vagar cage there. Yeah. He's catching uh, just about all of them there in that event. Horizon, Hachani taking just a little bit of damage from the Sand Soldiers, but otherwise, uh, you know, a pretty unscathing check there for KT. So there's has a lot of damage with BF Sword into Crit Cloak. Can't turret dive the Swain, but should do fine and trade. Hachani's oh, caught out. Hachani, yeah, he's going to go ahead and pop the ultimate, try to run out of here, but the pop up's going to come through from Blank. They lock him down, and he tries to get away with the headbutt, but it's not going to happen. He falls. Holds on to the flash, though, so knowing. His limits, just trying to buy some time for the rest of his team to either arrive and pick up some kills or to get out of there. I mean, Chani was the in no man's land to a lot of degree. Didn't have any friends in the area, and Alistair's not the same champion when it comes to disrespecting enemy damage this early in the game. So, well caught out by SKT. Collapsing on an Alistair would have been a mistake a few patches ago. Yep. Speaking of collapsing, they're collapsing on the Baron as well. Yeah, I mean, they did a very early one in the last game. Going for it again this time around at 27 minutes. Duke going to try to get up there. The last breath used by Someday. Never move. Not going to connect. Duke still sustaining flashes away. But here comes the ultimate out from Arrow. No Zonia is available, and that's going to be him going down. SKT peeling away from the Baron as well to try to answer. But it doesn't look like they're going to be able to find anything. Knockup comes in on the finger, gets rooted down, uses the cleanse to get out of it. Score looking for the jump in with the repel, but unable to find it. It's going to have to be them backing off, and someday not going to get clipped by the true shop. Barrage will remain safe. So all in all, summoner spells blown on both sides, but it's going to be Duke going down. And someday was the real hero in that scenario. It looked like he would have an irrelevant fight against Duke in the mid lane while the Baron was being taken by SKT, but instead got so much damage they managed to pick up the kill and confirm it as well, and that was enough to push SKT away from the Baron. So 
someday with what is expected to be a heavily split push focus build influenced a Baron play and will, keeps his teleport, will be able to return to bot lane and is itemizing heavily for the 1v1, heavily for staying out of team fights. Infinity Edge as his second full purchase. Yeah, he is looking really scary now on that Yasuo. I mean, who do you send against him? That's kind of the issue is that if there is a minion way for him to surf between with his E, it's very hard to hit him with skill shots, and thus he should win the side lane duel against any of the opponents. And if there's not a minion wave there for Duke, he can't get enough life back to try to out-sustain that damage, especially with the grievous wounds that Sunday has in his inventory. They will show. It looks like he's going to try and take an outer turret. Very reminiscent of the Fiora play we were seeing from Cuve. Yep. But he with a lot more kill pressure. Yeah, he's going to be able to get that no problem. Oh, but now Smash uh, do for Duke. Yeah, yeah he's, he's arriving uh, a bit too late. against Infinity Edge. And a level advantage. Now, he doesn't have a minion wave here someday, so he has slightly less options. Yeah, Duke's going to be able to regen off a lot of this bang now coming in, but that's going to be the last breath here. And Fly arriving yep. in with the TP as well. Event Horizon comes down, but Bang still finds the kill. Now the chase comes onto the Viger, who has to flash away. Bang still on hot pursuit, uh -oh. uses that E forward, trying to catch him, but the Mystic shots just aren't landing. So they won't be able to get him, but somebody takes out the turret, but loses his life for it. Yeah, the minion wave advantage, you pointed out, having a full access to a full minion wave helped with the sustain greatly. The next minion wave was actually so f much further away than I appreciated. And that's been this, ex this extended trade Donia's as well to drop aggro and continue to sustain. Even though Ezreal was the first person to get there, this looked like it would be a pretty one-sided win. You know, it was able to dodge out of the never move with the ultimate, but eventually all the sustain added up for Duke, even through Grievous Wounds, and the teleport from Vega contributed nothing. Yep, now Faker up in the top side. Kook comes out here from score. The root as well from the Jin. It looks like he might go down. Nice Emperor's Divide to stop the jump in from Hachani. Faker trying to find the kill. The Zonius comes out, and now Duke has arrived. So nice trying to lock down Arrow. Gets him with the Never Move, and Faker is going to stay alive. The Tether coming down on to Hachani as well. He goes in for the headbutt, but cannot find the damage, and it looks like he's going to fall as well, and he does. Faker barely coming out alive, and SKT finds another two kills, potentially three here as they try to get on to score. Wolf. Does he have the Mantra Q? The minions are there to block. The Spider Queen limping away, but she will be able to make it out. But that's going to be SKT going straight back over to this Baron. But here comes the teleport now from Someday. Can he make the hero play to stop this Baron? All oh, members the extremely low. Goes in onto Bang, but Faker jumps straight into his face, and he takes him out. Bang will find the kill. And SK Telecom continue to inch forward above KT. The health bars mean that perhaps the teleport was worth it because it truly denied the Baron. The members were low. They were first thinking about backing away the moment they saw the teleport channel. We're going to see the replay, but don't mistake this for Faker being fortunate. The start of the pick is very good, but you see Hachani gets too greedy looking for the flash head by Pulverize, has it denied by the Emperor's Divide. But notice that Faker has flashed this entire time, waits for the Zonius, waits for KT to fully commit to a bad fight where they could never have as many members as SKT, and then just win the fight from there. Being so steadfast on his summoner spell cooldown has always been a trademark of Faker's play, and it was beautiful to see. That it was, and if, oh man, if someday was able to get that triple kill at Baron, that would have been devastating for SK Telecom, but they come out on top, but as you mentioned, still a worthy play by someday, stopping that Baron from coming through. He had to use his teleport in order to do so, but all the same, denying that big global objective away from the enemy team. Yeah, and the criticism has to come back to KT looking for a fight around Baron, engaging a fight when they have a team comp not built for fighting. Yep. Oh, well. Yasuo doesn't want to fight. You can see SKT are certainly looking for a fight. Flash knock up there onto Arrow, who looks like he might be able to get out. But oh, here comes Faker oh, oh, oh. over the wall, just surfing in and taking him out. So casual like on that Azir. That's going to be two members going down the double carry here from KT Rollster. Just going to be someday the only person reliable for consistent damage. And that's going to send SKT packing straight back over to Baron while Faker applies some pressure in that mid lane. And this one should go down without a hitch. It doesn't matter that Blank has been DPSed out. Duke is also someone that can free tank Baron for a very extended amount of time. And Zero doesn't even have to come and help them. We'll delay the timer, but that's about it. SKT. Again, KT's greed at looking for a pick on Faker cost them in the previous game where they tried to all-in Faker on a flank and he outplayed them. Tried to all-in him around Baron, he outplayed them again. Fool me once, fool me twice. Faker continues his roll towards another win.
Yeah, shame on you, KT. And again, the reason why KT needed to not be in those scenarios is that Someday wants to be split pushing. It's a mistake for them to keep continuing to fight because, you know, I outlined it in Champion Select. You need a front line for Jin. He's only as strong as his front line because he doesn't have consistent DPS unless he can weave in and out with his spell cooldowns and his ultimate. Yeah. And it's only Elise. Elise has gone Rylai's Runic Echo and has a single tank item to her name. The Alistair, as we've noticed, has been so much more fragile than in seasons past. Vagar and Jin need a front line. They don't have one, but Yasuo has also built purely for the split push. So put all that together, look for picks with the four, but play defensive minded and have Yasuo a split push. And that's not something that KT has managed to do. Nope. And now we can see about a 7,000 gold lead starting the stretch here in favor of SK Telecom. And now you just don't have enough map pressure to truly split push because split pushing when you have inner turrets and it possible out of turrets is very straightforward, but when you have no turrets and your four-man group can be easily collapsed on, another Azir sec play onto Jin and Vega will probably decide this game if it's to happen soon. Now someday has to group and everything's out the window. Well, Vega's poised and ready for this one to happen. Jukes out the cocoon, so not gonna get caught up by this one. So just looking for an opening. Yeah, so Windwall's down as well. Yeah, someday's going into the back line, trying to get on a blank, but look at the damage coming out here from Bang and Faker. Working him down below half HP. Meanwhile, Duke split pushing the top side, getting that wave ready to crash into the inhibitor tower as that tier two falls. The bottom one goes down as well. Things are looking really good for SKT as they might be able to finish this set out 2 0. KT feels that sinking feeling in Kilios that. They felt in game one the moment that Fly died a third time during the laning I'm phase. I'm sure they felt this feeling a plethora of times going up against SK Telecom. <laughs> yep, there's been the fleeting ecstasy of some of the victories. The last regular Ooh. season game between these two was a 2-0 win for KT. Oh well, Engage. that's going to be Hachani trying to go in, but he can't catch Faker as he flashes away. Blank though getting caught up, and he will he go dies. down. Arrow finds the kill. Duke finishes out Is the teleport. The fight for KT? This could be the opening fight here. Here we go. Curtain call comes out. Kenny land the shots. Misses the first one. Finds Wolf on the second. Duke on the third. But Faker finishes off a Johnny. Scores too deep. Be Arrow backing off. Faker goes in deep. Almost takes out someday. He has to back off. Event Horizon comes down. They're just going to wait for this to expire and push forward. Scores still on the backside, but I don't think he can do anything. That's going to be the turn falling and the inhibitor going down as well. Now Faker going in, trying to find score. Gets rooted down by that W from the Jin. And they find more. Event Horizon not going to connect. Finger in a bad spot. Throws out the Empress of Mind. Goes in trying to find Arrow, but he can't do it. Meanwhile, Bank finishes off someday in the backside of the fight. And Wolf trying to just keep Duke shielded up to keep him sustained, but he gets caught out by the Event Horizon. Gets his own time. Back up. He's getting a little bit. Oh, this big shield comes out from the car, but he will be able to flash over the wall and get himself to safety. So all in all, it's just going to be Faker going down. They get Hachani, they get Semde, and they get the inhibitor on the bot side. It was a really fascinating extended turret siege from SKT. One of the big issues was they got that first pick onto blanking. Like, all right, is this the fight for KT? Elise and Score clearly thought that was the case. Went for a really aggressive wrap around, you know, near the blue buff to come around the back. It's just that Alistair tried to engage for the front, buying time for Elise to find a. Uh, angle from the back. Issue was, Alistair just dies because, of course, once again, isn't as tanky as the cow once was. And Elise was just caught woefully out of position, had to watch SKT take down both the inhibitor turret and the inhibitor because he was so far out of position. And thus, SKT very much win out on the objective trade, even though they were the first one to lose one of their members. Yeah. So, really well played by these guys so far, but these fights are still looking fairly close despite this near 10,000 gold lead that has amassed here in favor of SK Telecom. KT are still putting up one hell of a fight. They're definitely playing more cohesively than they were in the first game. So despite this massive deficit that is built up for them, I almost don't want to count them out of this game quite just yet. I think it's a big credit to KT. They've always been known as a team that team fights well in the late game. And what they've been doing in terms of splitting fights and playing around what they have is admirable. It's just what they have. The cavalry on the field is weaker than that of the enemy. Because once again, we've mentioned it team fight wise. This is where the comp for KT isn't selected to excel as the team fight phase. And losing map pressure has meant that Sunday has never really been able to team fight. So although he's very good at clearing out these super minions, Unless they pull off the biggest heist of a team fight, I just don't really see how KT can come up ahead. I mean, 
we were saying that when they played against MVP in their first game of the split. And uh, we saw exactly how that one turned out. So it's Miracles KT. against MVP and there's Miracles against SKT. Hey man, it happens. We can see though, all the dragons have been started up, but SKT are gonna say screw it, let's go straight for Hachani. The Event Horizon comes down and Faker takes a bunch of damage. Blank going in deep over the wall, trying to get onto Fly and work him down. But Score and Someday have other plans as they go over to this Dragon, which is starting to reset back and forth. Now Duke going in, forces the Flash out of Someday as he goes over the wall. This should just open up SKT to finish off the Elder Dragon. They're going to get that 50% increase to their Double Air and Infernal Drake combination that they have going on right now. So 12% increased stats at this moment now for SK Telecom. And you can see it's playing off really well as Bang on an Ezreal has 332 AD. 35 extra move speed. Fake is just rolling around at about 415 movement speed without something like the swiftness boots. So he's very, very quick. It compensates for the fact that he's gone the Sorcerer's Shoes in that particular case. The AP is stacking up. We see 853 yep. on Vega. So not quite 1,000 at 19 minutes. He's a little ways off from there. I mean, it's going to be interesting if we see more Vega. Working out the par timings for ability power is going to be so fascinating. There was once a world where 10 AP a minute was considered par, but death cap and just the way that AP values a balloon means that it's sometimes very difficult to conceptualize that fact. Look at this ult. The member is low. It's doing around 2,000 damage. Yeah, that's disgusting. I mean, Vega's ultimate has always just been supremely dirty no matter how who you use it on. And just much less, less of an anti-mage because he doesn't have the AP scaling based on enemy AP and now just yeah. delete squishies or members that have been heavily damaged because he does missing health damage. Oh wow, Bang going really aggressive. Not going to get hit by that Dark Matter. Does get some good damage down onto the Vagar for the time being. Two damage burn on these autos. It's really starting to stack up for SKT. They're looking to break the mid lane turret. Yep. Pushing in, they're going to get a ton of damage in onto this one as well. We can see almost going down to one more hit from Bang. We'll finish it out, and they do. Him and on that bottom side is going to be spawning really shortly. So that's going to alleviate some pressure from, from KT on that bottom side of the map and might allow them to contest it for this Baron. We which you can see his big start is absolutely melted by Faker and Blank at the moment. Don't need a Mountain Drake to take Baron fast. Someday wow. had to answer the minion wave. KT didn't even move in that direction. They knew that it, the Baron was an inevitable objective. Now they return to mid. They're pushing up these waves. SKT looking to close out a second game. Yep, it looks like they might be able to do that. But Horizon comes down just to try to keep them out as long as they possibly can. Inhibitor has now respawned at the bottom side. But they also have Duke to worry about, who's splitting up in the top lane as well. TP's available, so should a fight break out, we be damn sure he will be joining his team at a moment's notice. Inhibitor getting targeted, this one's gonna fall. And they find an opening though, Faker chunks out someday. That should force him back to the fountain as his inhibitor goes down to the mid side. We can see SKT just gonna rotate up top and replicate the scenario. There's no counterplay for KT, they're looking for the cry engage, they're looking for the flash. Massive Yasuo ult. Oh, oh Hachana goes in, he boots away. One with the headbutt, only finds Duke with the polarize. Blank goes in, knocks up, score fly, trying to kite back as best as he can. Arrow though, as well, looking like he's gonna fall, and he does, the hex trigger just not enough. Meanwhile, Faker just 1v1ing someday, and that's gonna send SK Telecom straight on to the Nexus Towers and the Nexus itself as it falls here at just about 42 minutes. So SKT, as they whittle down these final members of KT Rolster, are going to be starting off the season with a 4-0. They're going to give KT Rolster their first loss and that in the means match. that KT are now 0-5 on the trot against SKT. They 2-0'd them in the second best of three of summer. Famously lost 3-0 in the playoffs and now 2-0 in this game. SKT continue their march. They, next to Samsung, are the only undefeated teams so far in champion summer so pencil in that samsung versus skt match because suddenly it's a battle once again two years later of 1v2 yep that one is going to take place just a week from today bob smith you will have that i believe it's our second game of next saturday but that is going to be one to definitely check out and with that win i believe that that puts sk telecom into second place for the time being and kt falling down the fourth Yep, so KT now 2-1, and one, SKT 2-0, and oh, but of course that clean game score that only Samsung has been able to do. SKT looked great 
Puma in an interview previous to the start of this season said, please understand that our summer performance might see a bit of suffering. We've had less time to prepare. We haven't been able to get on that new patch. It definitely doesn't show in their gameplay and the elements that worked in the old patches still stay true. Azir, by far once again, the leader in terms of damage, but actually Ezreal yeah. down to third. Swain from the top lane. Really nice shift put together by Duke. KT tried something. They needed yeah. to. They went for the Yasuo pick. It pigeonholed them into only Swift Push, but SKT picking up all the free objectives from KT being overzealous around Baron meant that Swift Push had to be abandoned 15 minutes before the end of the game. And the inevitable roll roll from SKT, whether it's the roll towards an LCK title or a game win or a world's win, SKT rolls on. Yep, they do. Someday, just having a bit of an unfortunate game there. We can see, though, the MVP. Yet again, it's going to be Faker. So he's going to be a double MVP, and he joins Hachani and Ambition and Ruler at the top of the standings at the moment for the split so far. So we will get an interview with the man himself in just a little bit.